They're working on one of the loneliest and most isolated mainline railways in the world. This is Australia's Nullarbor Plain, literally the plain with no trees. A quarter million square kilometres of salt bush, blue bush and limestone bedrock. It's dry, it's flat and in summer the temperature can often top 50 degrees Celsius. Just one reason that early railway builders found the task of spanning the continent too difficult. Today, long haul tracks like this are the nation's most vital rail corridors. Yet for decades they remained the railway system's missing links. On the Nullarbor Plain, trains on Australia's longest rail corridor encounter the longest straight stretch of track in the world, 478 kilometres without a curve. The total corridor is eight times as long, 4,000 kilometres from Sydney in the east to Perth in the west. The sheer distance helps to make this an almost perfect modern railway. The ideal railway has always been said to run flat and straight between two large cities. In today's competitive transport world, the further apart those cities are, the better. The transcontinental is in fact the only truly profitable interstate route in the country. Today, tracks like this bind the continent together Yet there were good reasons why they were also among the last rail connections to be made. Most of Australia's early railways would never be linked together and a major cause of that fragmentation was the character of the continent itself. In almost every case, railways heading inland found themselves in increasingly arid country. Spectacular country lay at Australia's heart, but it would never support the cities and farms that railways needed to pay their way. Discouraged from pushing further inland, too many railways wound up as one-way streets. They had spanned distances that on other continents would have linked a dozen cities. But all they had reached was a tiny railhead. All they had found were seasonal cargoes, wheat or wool or sheep. Even in rail's heyday, a siding at the end of the line could be lucky to see one train a week. Now and then, a railway pushing inland did strike it rich. Set in dry spinifex country a thousand kilometres from the coast, Mount Isa's copper could only be tapped by rail. In turn, the rich copper field helped the railway pay its way. Perhaps Australia had discovered a new kind of railway. Not one that ran between two cities, but from an outback mine to the sea. Certainly in Queensland, heavy mineral halls were important from the start, and they still are. But this vast and decentralised state was a courageous railway builder in any case, actually laying 10,000 kilometres of track, more than any other state. In the early days, though, Australia's biggest railway system was also its most fragmented. 
Originally five separate Queensland railways each reached back from a separate coastal port. Today at least some of these ports are busier than ever. Gladstone in central Queensland is one of the biggest coal loading operations in the world. Even so, an interesting question remains. Why did early railways in all states invariably head inland when most of the population lived close to the coast? The explanation is simple enough. Ships already had the coastal trade tied up. Coastal shipping was well established long before railways came. The ships were close to competitive in speed and certainly on price. Some railways would finally indulge in ruthless price cutting, designed to destroy the private shipping trade. But for a long time, rail stuck to what it did best, linking the outback with the sea. That situation explains why by 1900, Queensland in particular had so many isolated tracks. A coastal line connecting most of them up wasn't completed until 1924. Today, that coastal line is Queensland's busiest. Busy enough to justify two major passenger services, the Sunlander and also the Queenslander, one of Australia's most luxurious travel trains. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen on the Queenslander. Breakfast is about to be served in the dining car. Could all passengers please make their way down now? Just repeating that breakfast is about to be served in the dining car. Thank you. The sheer scale of the state still makes train travel an attractive option for people as well as freight. The 2,000 kilometre journey from Brisbane to Cairns is still a long way to go by car. And the lush coastal scenery along the way is spectacular too. Not only does the train link a dozen coastal cities along the way, at the end of its run, it reaches Cairns. From the beginning, most Australian trains headed inland, and if they were sometimes destined to end up nowhere much, they also faced challenges just getting out of town. Behind all the east coast capital cities ran the Great Dividing Range, mountains that had to be crossed before trains could serve the hinterland. Sydney was an extreme case. Mountains to south and west and north of the city, trains faced a water hazard as well. The wide and swift-flowing Hawkesbury Estuary wasn't bridged until 1889. No less challenging were the rugged sandstone tablelands that enclosed Sydney on every side. Battlements that seemed impassable at first. Deep grades, deep cuttings, long tunnels and tight curves. Even today, this difficult terrain still affects rail operations in New South Wales. 
the cost of maintaining and upgrading lines like these is monumental. Back in the 1860s, the challenge of crossing these mountains at all seemed monumental in itself. Railway engineers came up with a solution that left New South Wales with a remarkable legacy. Now bypassed, this track, called a zigzag, was opened in 1869 and judged at the time to be one of the engineering wonders of the railway world. Preserved by enthusiasts, this zigzag was one of two. They were designed to get traffic up to the tableland and down the other side. This western zigzag let trains climb and descend a sheer rock face that barred the way to western New South Wales. It was an ingenious solution, as volunteer driver Michael Forbes explains. Back in the 1860s when we were putting the railway over the mountain, they got to the top of the hill at Clarence and then they had to get the railway down to the Lithgow Valley floor. It's about 600 feet. The only way they could do it was to carve a giant Z in the side of the hill i.e. build a zigzag. And this was a series of ramps. The top road was the top bar of the Z, middle road was the middle bar of the Z, and bottom road was the bottom bar of the Z, and these sloped gently down towards Lithgow at a, an angle that could be safely negotiated by a loaded steam locomotive and train. Right to go. Constant shunting simply adds to the fun for modern enthusiasts. But back when the zigzag was part of the main line, it could also be time consuming, particularly as traffic grew. Crossing the mountains meant four shunts. The line was single track, and trains on the zigzag had to contend with steep grades as well. At the moment, we're on the steepest part of the track. The grading it up here goes from a constant rise of about one in 44 to one in 34, and you'll hear the engine start to labour in a second. You can hear the hill having its effect on us, it's starting to slow us down. And I've got my hand on the sanding valve, because if the wheels start to slip, I get some sand under it and keep the traction on the track. The zigzags actually served the main line for only 40 years. They'd been a vital link in the railway chain, but finally sheer traffic congestion forced them to close. By 1910, both zigzags had been replaced by tunnels. Today, those tunnels still form part of Australia's transcontinental route. With 4,000 kilometres still to go, the Indian Pacific Passenger Express, bound for Perth, has already tackled the toughest grades of its journey, just two hours out of Sydney. Transcontinental has a unique edge as a travel train. Its three-day journey from coast to coast offers passengers a remarkable slice of the real Australia. Beyond the divide, the Indian Pacific does find country where it can at last run flat and straight. And it's out of these endless plains, half a day later, that the train's first major destination finally appears. 
In the 1890s, Broken Hill, 1,200 kilometers west of Sydney, saw the richest silver strike on Earth. Vast deposits that, along with lead and zinc, have been mined intensively ever since. In theory, Broken Hill, like Mount Isa, was exactly the kind of outback prize that railways sought. But in fact, the town was so remote from Sydney that the first New South Wales railway didn't reach here until 1927. And by then, South Australia had already stepped in to claim the prize. By 1927, Broken Hill had already been a boom town for 30 years. And for all that time, most of the benefits of that prosperity had gone to South Australia. Most unusually of all, they had done so thanks to a private railway. Officially, South Australia's trains could only run as far as the border town of Coburn, 50 kilometres short of Broken Hill. A private company offered to fill the gap. They built what they euphemistically called the Silverton Tramway, but it was a heavy haul railway in all but name. The tramway continued to serve for nearly 80 years, and some of its heritage is preserved at Broken Hills Railway Museum. After 1927, the line supplied a missing link between the public railways of South Australia and New South Wales. And according to museum curator Ron Carter, it also set an example to both. They uh, worked um, the uh, main line from the South Australian border to Broken Hill uh, during the whole of their life and uh, each year they made a profit uh, whereas the government railway systems on either side uh, showed uh, huge deficits. The Silverton Tramway Company, over those 82 years of main line operation, made a handsome profit. Probably because private enterprise um, tend to um, get more out of people and machines than government railways. All of the Silverton Tramway Company's locomotives were loaded to their absolute maximum on the main line, and when they'd stop, they'd take one truck off, and that was the set load. Um, that was the way they set the loads for all their mainline trains. All their people worked very hard and uh, I think it was probably um, because the company uh, used to show attention to detail. The Silverton Tramway still exists. Not on the main line, but the company provides shunting and marshalling services around Broken Hill. It's a company with a remarkable legacy. By the time mainline operations ceased in 1969, it had become the most profitable Australian railway ever built. The reason the Silverton Tramway survived so long was that even when New South Wales trains did reach Broken Hill, they could go no further. They ran on standard gauge, and the tramway was narrow gauge. As so often in Australia, it was a case of all change, please, with the tramway gaining the benefit. And if you wanted to catch a train from Sydney to Adelaide, you had to come via the standard gauge to Broken Hill, and then uh, included in your fare, of course, was a um, taxi fare from the Crystal Street station across to uh, the Sulphide Street station where we are at the moment. That was the uh, Silverton Tramway Company's passenger terminal at Broken Hill. And then you'd catch the narrow gauge train from Broken Hill down to Tarawi, where you would, of course, change then into the broad gauge five foot three train for the journey to Adelaide. The Indian Pacific still changes locos at Broken Hill, but passengers can stay on board. The line from Sydney to Perth was finally converted to standard gauge in 1969. A year later, the Indian Pacific became the first passenger train ever to cross Australia from coast to coast. The locos that take over here are those of the AN line, Australia's national railway. 24 hours ahead is the Nullarbor Plain, and it was the national government that originally built the track. Early this century, it was the need to build a railway across the Nullarbor that first brought the federal government onto the railway scene. Without this track, 
Australia's railways would have been left with a vital missing link. But for a long time it was a line that no state government had the will to build. The challenges of cost and distance were horrendous. State governments saw railways as a way of promoting settlement, and there was little to encourage settlement out here. Clearly enough, in the interests of national unity, the track that no one else would lay would have to be built by the federal government. And so, in 1912, the assault on the Nullarbor began. In those days, the Nullarbor Plain was a no-man's land. Camel country. And it was with camels that surveyors began to mark out the line of track. A human army followed, reshaping the landscape as it went. The track that was laid and how it was laid has been a source of legend ever since. Picks and shovels against the desert. Mass movement of men and materials into country that only a handful of Europeans had ever seen. Men working in some of the most inhospitable country on earth still managed to set some remarkable records. The most railway ever laid in the world in a day, a month, a year. In the process, Australia's infant steel industry also found its feet, supplying the huge demand for rails. In 1917, the trans nullarbor Railway opened for business. The trains were as luxurious as any of their time, but they were still part of a piecemeal system. To get this far, passengers from Sydney had already changed trains no less than five times. Today, the Indian Pacific is a true transcontinental. But the train does still make one stop on the Nullarbor Plain. Station Master Merv Gould can rightly claim to be a leading citizen of this tiny settlement because the only reason that he and a handful of other people live out here is to serve the trains. This is Cook, a town whose only real attraction is that it's about as remote as a town can be. For passengers, the stop at Cook is a highlight of the Indian Pacific adventure. Trains also refuel here and drivers change. But that's routine. For most passengers, this is a once in a lifetime stopover. In two full days, the Indian Pacific has travelled just over halfway across Australia. With two more days to Perth, it's about now that the passengers start to realise the scale of the continent and the magnitude of the challenge the early railway builders faced.
standard gauge came to the transcontinental just in time. A hundred years ago, railways began the process of shrinking the continent. Their present economic survival depends on long-haul routes like this. And for the future, rail will not depend on passenger trains like the Indian Pacific. It will be heavy freight hauled across distances daunting even to modern road transport. And ironically, rail's survival now depends on the very tracks that were once the railway's missing links.